using evidence, and looking at what the science tells us. And so from our perspective, we feel that, that climate change is happening, that the evidence is pointing to that fact, that, that, um, you know, that, that things are, are changing, that, that human activity is, is largely responsible for it. Um, as I say, the science is clear. Um, we know that temperatures, global temperatures have risen. Uh, we, uh, we're saying about 0.85 degrees since 1880, since the uh, start of the uh, Industrial Revolution. Um, in Canada, we almost are double that level. So in Canada, the, the estimates are that the temperature has risen 1.6 degrees. And uh, in the north, it's actually, uh, the, the science says that we're over two degrees. And, um, and, and two degrees is a fairly critical number. The sense is that if we surpass that two degree warming, um, we're going to see extreme weather, we're going to see a lot of things that we really don't want to as, as humans to have happen on the earth. And, uh, and we already know that that is happening in the northern regions of, uh, of, of the, uh, the planet. And so the sense is that now is the time to have this discussion where you know, we may even be a, a few years um, past when we should have started it, but um, our government feels that it is very important to start talking about this now so that we can come up with actions to try and, and deal with the, the factors that are leading to uh, global warming. One of the, uh, the uh, key events in the last year um, since our government came to term was the Paris Agreement. And so we were one of 195 signatories to that. And, and basically what the, those countries have indicated is that we're going to limit, um, or work to uh, um, limit uh, the, the warming uh, of the, the climate, uh, of the Earth's temperature by the, this two degree uh, number. And in fact, it'd be better if we could go lower. And so we would like to strive for 1.5%, but the target is 2% uh, warming as the, the maximum, maximum that, uh, that, we'll, um, that we'll accept. Things, you know, what are the results of climate change? And uh, so, you know, some of the things that we're seeing uh, that how it manifests itself, we end up with these extreme weather events. So it's not always about, um, you know, we're having a cool July right now, or it feels like a cool July. Well, does that mean climate change isn't happening? Well, no, but it means that um, when we have um, events that they're going to be more extreme, uh, so it could be tornadoes, it could be floods, it could be fires, all of those things. So you, the, the, the extremes of, of these events um, will become greater unless we start dealing with this. Uh, longer, hotter heat waves um, are another way that, uh, that it can show itself. There's a real concern, particularly in Canada and, and northern regions, that we could be seeing the loss of things like permafrost and uh, the Arctic ice pack. And, um, and then uh, that would have implications on the <coughs> indigenous population, particularly in northern Canada. When we look at where greenhouse gases are originating, this uh, pie chart shows where they're coming from. Now, I, I heard a figure that uh, it's something like 60% um, of greenhouse gases are attributed to urban development or cities. And so when I looked at this, it's like, well, how does that math work out? Because uh, we have buildings, 12%. But um, you know, there's things like waste um, add to it. Um, uh, transportation is a, a huge uh, piece of it, and a lot of that is how we move around cities, and uh, and then you know how industries, um, uh, you know, some of the manufacturing, those types of things. Um, but, but this is you know where our uh, the emissions are coming from, and uh, you know it's not that one strategy will deal with all of these issues, and so the sense is we're going to have to have multiple strategies to uh, to try and keep that warming uh, at capped at that two two degrees and possibly aim for that lower 1.5 degrees that I mentioned previously. If anybody has any questions or comments, like I said, I want to keep this fairly informal and uh, um, so jump in at any time or if you need clarification. Um, here, the, this is uh, some projections on where the um, greenhouse gas uh, targets could go if we don't do anything. And uh, so you can see the, the graph uh, you know, continuing um, to climb up to 2030. And so one of the, the phrases that comes out is, how do we bend the curve? And so really what we're trying to, to get at is that um, we've set a target of 622 units, and um, these are in met, uh, metatons of uh, carbon dioxide. And so if we leave things unchecked, we're gonna see the, uh, the carbon dioxide entering the atmosphere continuing to climb in, in Canada. 
And so what we want to do is try to come up with strategies. And that's what a, a lot of this evening is going to be about, is getting your thoughts and ideas on how we start bending this curve and bringing it down. And then how do we actually achieve, uh, by 2030, this 524 tar um, metric ton target? And, uh, you know, because if it is unchecked, we won't see that uh, continued growth, and then we will not meet those targets. We'll you know, probably surpass that two degree mortgage. Uh, that including carbon offsets to farming off to the US? Oh, well, sorry? Does that include or exclude the carbon offsets? Um, good question. Uh, I, I believe that it does not include the carbon offsets. I think that's the, the raw data. Um, but I can check on that. Uh, I didn't make the graph, so I can find out from those who did if if, um, if we can, um, I can clarify that for you. Because the carbon offsets in Canada account for roughly 10%. So that will throw your graph out dramatically, and all your numbers. Okay. Yeah. So it, it's it's a huge it's a huge factor with, with the forests in, in Canada, and we're selling most of those carbon offsets to the states. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Just curious. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I don't have the answer, but uh, right. good question. Um, on this one, um, so you know, some of the, the process we've gone through, um, we. Um, had uh, some meetings starting in November. Uh, shortly after our government was elected, there was the uh, Paris Climate Conference going through. And, and um, what we're aiming toward now is having the first ministers um, come together with a plan for Canada by this fall. And so again, these consultations are really about getting out, talking to Canadians, and that will help inform the, uh, the position that the federal government can take forward when we meet with the uh, premiers uh, from across the country uh, to come up with this Canadian uh, strategy that we're we're trying to develop. Uh, there are four working groups that um, are going to be uh, tackling some of these different areas. So there's uh, mitigation, carbon pricing, uh, the whole issue of adaptation, adaptation and resilience, and then uh, looking at clean technology, innovation and jobs, and how we can actually try to get off carbon. And, uh, and, and there's some uh, economic pieces, uh, you know, how do we grow the economy um, in a clean energy kind of So for um, uh, yeah, for this evening, um, we're going to be looking at you know what ideas you have for um, that Canada should be applying to, uh, for uh, dealing with climate change. And as I said, we'll be uh, recording the ideas, the feedback that we get this evening, um, uploading it to the interactive website, and I can share some information on that. So if you go home and have some additional thoughts that you, you know, just it hadn't come to your mind, but when you're lying in bed tonight. And, and, and something else comes, you can still uh, give that to us. It's not, it's not going to be too late when we hit 8 o'clock this evening. And, uh, and then um, we'll be sharing the information that we collect nationally with all of these working groups that are uh, um, putting their minds together and how we deal with it. So with that, I'm done talking. And uh, what I'm going to do is throw it out to the group. So these are the kind of questions we're going to try to work through this evening. Um, you're looking at what are your experiences with climate change? You know, what, what's brought you up this evening? What, um, you know, why is it of interest to you? And, and we can do that um, you know, fairly, possibly fairly briefly. Um, but it's important uh, for us to understand why, uh, why people are interested in this. And then we're gonna get into um, some of the solutions that you would like to see governments, businesses, and communities implement. Have you given any thought to this? And uh, it's a great way for us to start getting ideas on, on what Canadians um, would feel uh, would be acceptable strategies where you don't want us to go. And uh, so we'll have a bit of a discussion on that one. Um, the economy, you know, we don't want to um, cause uh, the economy to collapse. And so um, how do we actually, uh, you know, try to uh, have jobs and everything else as we um, have the shift from uh, carbon-based fuels and a, a carbon-based economy to something else? and um, ideas to promote innovation and new technologies. If anybody has read something you think we should be looking at, if you have expertise, uh, ideas, um, you know, we'll capture some of that. And, uh, and then um, looking at adaptation. And so how do we prepare in the Langleys and Langley, um, in, in this part of the world to some of the effects that could be coming. So it could be uh, flooding, it could be extreme, some of those other extreme uh, um, weather events. So with that, does anybody want to start? Are there any other questions that you'd like to uh, really tackle? Yes. Uh, the main reason we're coming out uh, of your own talk 
aside from meeting you, <laughs> um, uh, speaking to uh, uh, friends and family, uh, what we don't want to see is a carbon tax. BC has had a carbon tax, and it goes into some sort of fund, which uh, <coughs> many people probably don't know what fund it, it's going into, nor how that money is actually being spent. So what we do, we do, what, I, what, uh, uh, what I don't want to see is an, another carbon tax, and um, if there is a carbon tax and it goes into another fund, have an independent audit uh, on a at least an annual basis to see where that money goes. Because um, another slush fund to do whatever is is not what I want to see. Okay. Great to be back. Well, uh, the BC the BC uh, a version of the carbon tax doesn't uh, apparently fund rapid transit. Um, uh, even though that uh, that uh, a sky train for for the Lyonese or, or whatnot would, would uh, definitely help with uh, with uh, reducing carbon, but our carbon tax is not going to fund it. I mean, the premier has made that clear. Yeah, as, the premier, as, we were, as we were talking, sorry, um, sorry, just before we start this evening, though, um, one of the uh, the things that the the um, prime minister and the the uh, provincial leaders have agreed to is that there will be some form of of carbon pricing, and uh, the, the, we're, what the federal government has said is that they're not going to set one size fits all a one size fits all strategy that the provinces will be able to come up with their own. And, and actually, what BC has done has been seen as a real leader in the country, but Ontario and Quebec are taking a different approach. And uh, and so, you know, my understanding is that there will be some form of carbon pricing. What I'm hearing you say is that you know, there, there needs to be a, an accountability to that, um, so that the that Canadians know how that is actually achieving the goals that are being set to deal with climate change. Is that? Uh, yeah, uh, if there has to be a carbon tax at all. Again, I don't want another tax. And I, I think many Canadians would, would say the same. Uh, but Who's yeah, to each their own. Sorry? How many people no. are Yeah, a lot of the, the that, right. Because you know, if Just you've got that. rapid, if you've got um, bus service that's reliable, uh, then you drop, you know, the uh, basically the CEO the CEO's running over over two million dollars a year. Yeah. yeah. No, I agree. Okay, we're going to jump over. You, you, you yeah, patiently I'm waiting. Sure. I, I was in Cloverdale recently about three months ago to go to the museum. And I noticed that the interurban line is still in Coverdale. And I walked over to read the sign because I like public transit to come from the UK, like fast trains. Right. So I saw the sign and it said, you can ride at so many stops for something like $20. And I thought, mm, okay. But this shouldn't be just for you know a tourist or a summer event or, a, you know. They want to, it's a group of people who want to, I forget their name, they want to bring back that train line. So I Googled it and it said that that line still runs from US Minister to Chilliwack. So that line could effectively be brought back to life. They put in beautiful, you know, uh, cars like you see in Western Europe, you know, or anywhere in Europe, wherever they are. Those beautiful colored cars, like the C train in Calgary, right down a road, you know, middle of a road, and it's beautiful. And so if they could do that, that's one idea where the tracks are still there from US Minister to Chilliwack, um, you know, something could be done to bring it safe and sunny to Blackley, you know, initially, whatever. And then I was listening on the radio, and uh, <laughs> this, um, I think he was a lawyer, I just forget his title, but he said that um, in Quebec, that there are um, millionaire immigrants that come in from Asia and they are taxed by the Quebec government, um, you know, quite heavily, to the tune of one billion a year that they are receiving from these millionaire immigrants. So then this man suggested that, I think in BC, when he was involved with that apparently here, and uh, it wasn't taken on board, but that's probably many, many years ago, I think, when he worked in that area. But um, he said, you know, and then the commentators on the station 
was saying, well, that right away, if, if, even if every province had something like an immigration tax for these millionaire immigrants, that would cover a lot of infrastructure for transportation, for affordable housing, and that could be solved. And I thought, oh, it sounds brilliant. It sounds like a, an excellent, sensible idea to cover a lot of the needs that we have for our transportation infrastructure. Yeah, okay, yeah, thank you. Oh, yeah. Just a, a couple of, of comments, and, and I'm not here to say about anything that's said or shared. Um, on, on the program, there was actually a really good article in The Sun in the last day or two that I was reading just recently about that um, immigration program. Yeah. And uh, it, it is a, a, an investor's uh, program that um, wealthy businessmen can come to Canada in, and there's a, you know, you have to have so much money, so that's that program. Um, the, the interurban line, and Rudy, do you know, my understanding is that a lot of the line is intact, but it's not entirely intact. Mary, do you know? Yeah, I can actually speak to that. I'm very full, like I'm the MLA for money. Um, so I, and I used to be Minister of Transportation. It is a lovely idea, I love the idea of trains. There's two problems with it. Uh, actually, there's three. The one is that the line isn't entirely intact. Um, the second is, while it sounds like it would be cheaper because there's already a line there, because it isn't designed for passenger transportation, you actually have to retrofit the whole line, um, and it blows your budget. It'd be way cheaper for us to develop new rapid transit, maybe up and down the Fraser Highway Board or something like that. Um, so that might be the better route to go. The so third, so the interurban line, there's none of that left at all? There's a lot of it left, but not completely. And then the last piece that makes it challenging is because while it does go through some dense areas, it also goes through areas that are uh, very heavily ALR land, so you couldn't even develop them eventually, right? What you want to achieve um, with rapid transit is even if you don't have density all up and down the line right away, you want to be able to develop it eventually, right, as more and more people use the rapid transit. And unfortunately, where the interurban is right now, by and large, it's going through a lot of ALR land where you would never be able to develop density, so your ridership would get high. But the so, original interurban, though, it went from downtown back to Chilliwack. To Chilliwack. Mm -hmm. But so my dad will tell you. We went to the Air Force and up yep. to Chilliwack. But my dad will tell you it also took three hours, right? So the point the, 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 it, it did. You're saying the ALR, LA, ALR is the barrier. But it well, was it's, it's it, one of it was there. It was all probably there from downtown back to the all the way to the so, so, and Chilliwack. But so the it was there, not through ALR. Yeah, but the Agricultural Land Reserve came in, 19, in the 1970s. And what that means, though, is that there's a whole lot of land along that corridor never develop the residential. Well, it wasn't, the, the agricultural land reserve wasn't there. So we need rapid transit along that corridor, but although like the, the uh, heritage rail and all, it, it, it sounds wonderful, it's just not practical. It, it would make more sense from a taxpayer standpoint to pay the money to have rapid transit up and down Fraser Highway than to use the well, that would be nice. I agree. Do that. And so, <laughs> 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 Ask, you know, is that something that, that this group would like to see as an investment in, in transit? And, you know, I've talked to a few of you um, before, and that seemed to be, uh, um, Scott, good idea of transit? So. Yeah, of course. Congratulations, John, on your um, oh. successful campaign. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I believe transit's always a big issue for the Langley's and Surrey area, right? I mean, it's uh, been long neglected over the last 15, 20 years, so that's a much-needed investment. I think good stand for the environment, but... Um, that sort of takes the conversation from our environment a little bit to taxes and transit and infrastructure. I wanted to ask a question about uh, local environment conditions. So does the government have any plans for the communities of Langley City, um, Cloverdale, possibly to address local environment issues like contaminations of soils, creeks, and waterways locally? Um, it's yeah. important for the community, you know, like, uh, you know, to focus locally on what's what's directly affecting our communities, our health, our environment locally. Right. Yeah, and I think you know for, for this evening we're trying to look at you know how do we deal with with the big climate change picture. Um, but you know to to that point, uh, our government has invested or committed twenty billion dollars over ten years, um, with four billion of that being loaded um, front loaded in the next couple of years um, to do a lot of the the research and innovation support. Um, there's uh, work on mitigating uh, effects of some of these extreme uh, factors, so things like diking. Um, we met with the city of Surrey and township of Langley yesterday, 
and uh, Daikin came up. Um, there's also things like um, on the Serpentine and the Nickel Nickel Rivers, um, there are, um, uh, there's a, a dam structure so that if we end up with uh, the polar ice caps melting, then we'll see the oceans rise, which could uh, bring saline, saline uh, ocean water inland, which would destroy a whole bunch of the agricultural land in, uh, in Langley and Surrey. And uh, so, you know, our investment would actually be able to provide a, a um, or reinforce the um, diking and damming structure that's there. Um, so, so those are the types of things we're looking at. Uh, things like contaminated sites, not so much that's seen as being more of a, a local um, municipal level. But again, if that's, if we feel that there would be an objective um, that could help with, you know, dealing with climate change, you know, maybe it's that we're not uh, creating urban sprawl that we could contain by, uh, by building within already disturbed areas, then a case could be made for that kind of investment. And that's really, you know, Yeah, what, I think what it's just nice if we focus locally, you know, that, that will, if everybody focused globally on their own specific environment, the whole problem as a whole would be much better. So I think if we, instead of looked at the huge problem of global warming, which is just overwhelming to most, right, we could more focus on our communities and neighborhoods and say, this is where the pollution is in our neighborhood. This is where we are polluting the environment. And if everybody focused that down to that level, I think globally or you know, nationally, the problem would be easier to contain, I would assume. To add to what you say, um, for instance, uh, neonicotinoids that are killing the bees, and if locally you were to have an area that said, no, you're not allowed to spray with certain pesticides and things that could kill this, this, and this, and we, should, we could do that locally to get what's spread a lot better and I think easier. easier and then when you yeah. do it very, very big, you know, right. it's hard to get everybody on board at once, but I see a lot of small municipalities that are locally doing a lot for the environment. They need a lot more backing from bigger government and more probably more money for innovation and new incentives for renewables and things like that. Okay. Yeah. Yes. I just want to get in uh, what I came here for. Right. So you're, you're more concerned about the, the um, or the concern would be, if I'm hearing you, the uh, method of extracting um, cleaner um, uh, fuels such as uh, LNG um, compared to... Fresh water, uh, drinkable water, and 
there's no technology that, that uh, uh, the industry knows of that can turn the wastewater, the byproduct of, of fracking, uh, into clean water again. This is why I feel we should be turning to seeing geothermal energy and alternate energies that are cleaner for the environment. I don't believe gas. We, we're sort of we're not moving forward with all these new technologies fast enough, and giving the companies that are innovating them our money to continue to push forward. Because when I looked at Iron and Earth, uh, these guys from the oil industry are trying to get jobs in geothermal and clean energy right now, and and. They're eating a stone wall with the government, just complete, you know, elements to go. So, so yeah. investment in that, in the innovation uh, field for, uh, for clean energy is something that you'd like to see. Is there general agreement uh, yes. with that as a, uh, a priority? Well, okay. and, and, and you know, increase the, uh, I'm sorry, increase the uh, um, canopy. So is this talking yeah, like a deal with things like deforestation? Is that? Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, you know what I think. Gas is because it absorbs so much of CO two and therefore recycles the air back in the. Yeah. You know, so the, the the bigger the the forest, the the better it is for the for the global earth because it, it takes out so much of the CO two. Yeah. Right. Even that, but even the, so, the forest but can die. If it's that in Germany, I think the black oh, yeah. forest part of it died because there was that much CO2 being oh, pumped into the atmosphere. A chunk of the black forest died. We took, they built houses there yeah. on, on some of the black forests in Germany. Yeah. But, but I heard a lot of them died. I mean, man can do a lot of damage yeah. to this earth, and he is. But I was going to say the point, that yes. the, uh, the writing is on the wall. Uh, time is of the essence, as we like to say. And I just think that if you don't grasp hold of the future in regards to the clean energies, Canada's gonna die. It's gonna be left right behind. The, you, you know, there won't be, because it's a small population here, even though it's a beautiful country, and we'd be left behind. And the thing is, we're just gonna pollute ourselves and kill ourselves. And that's what man is doing. He's killing himself, he's killing his oceans, he's killing his beautiful fish, which well, you is know an that. excellent food source. So I think I'm gonna ask, Honor, can you are you pushing for the clean energies, the solar panels, the geothermal, the wind power, the ocean power? Are you pushing for those? In well, you know, I think government? that those are all the the um, types of investments that our government would like to see. But it's you know, it's also about about um, uh, you know, how do we transition from what we have now to something else? And there may be things that we we haven't even um, found out yet. Or you know, and, and I think that's where this investment in, in, in innovation and technology. Is, is really important. Could it be though that the, the government provincially, uh, provincial governments and federal could give incentives to people, say, who own property, you know, homes or businesses, give incentives, tax incentives to have solar panels placed on their properties? Well, to it's have so the easy. wind power. I think you know, those are the types of questions we're asking you know, is what would that, that be of interest, uh, oh, yeah. you know, pursuing alternate energies and having yeah. support? 30 odd years ago in Australia, they did that. They are providing incentives to put solar panels in there. They actually build up around Broken Hill um, various houses, totally solar power. And if you, wow. this is 35, 40 years ago. They did not. They were off the grid completely, and they could run everything. Your fridges, your air conditioning. Um, Realising Broken Hill is pretty much in the centre of Australia, so daytime temperatures of in the sun were common, 40 plus for weeks on end, and you were living in nice peaceful environments that dropped off to a certain extent and they didn't follow that one through why i don't know but um it, it fell apart but they're, they're the sort of technologies that are there um australia's been also running the um the solar energy race north south um through australia for 40 years um, i think years? there's a caveat so, here which is the first nation
I'm sorry. All right. I think that most of the people I know think the First Nations are completely run right over by the government who never listen to you fully at all. Um, no consultation for Site C uh, that meant anything. Right now that's being bulldozed as we speak without any approval from the First Nations in that area. And also the BC, Land, BC Utilities Commission was not allowed to speak on the Site C dam. And we do have geothermal that would do a better job and a cheaper job for us, but we're not allowed to look at it. The joint review panel said no to the site C dam. Yet right now, the federal government to stop it and look at it and allow the BC Utilities Commission to look at it and talk to the First Nations because the First Nations were not talked to in the previous government. And this is the reason the Conservatives are here right now. <laughs> but on, on things like, so, um that affects us, is I'm just, the reason I brought up Site C, yeah. that land, that farmland, could be farmland that we might need for our food one day for our food security. It's prime farmland that's going to be flooded, and if the sea level rises like they say it's going to, we might lose a lot of our lower Fraser Valley farmland in the, in the future generations. So Which is, I think, you know, why we're trying to develop the strategy right. now to prevent the well, two degree um, I think it should be because no hold on Site C. What about uh, national building codes? Uh, okay. As a uh, in solution, if uh, you have national building codes that say, for example, require that one example be uh, windows uh, uh, be uh, triple triple layered and whatnot, that uh, both uh, saves on energy needed and energy uh, used, and that can be applied nationally. Okay. So looking at leading. I just want to go, is there anybody who hasn't spoken yet that yeah. has any thoughts in any of these kind of broad categories or other thoughts you have that, um, you know, because like I say, it's, it's fairly free flowing about, uh, you know, it's just trying to, you know, get the things that you, uh, you know, thoughts, concerns that you've had. Uh, it could be even a question that you have um, that you'd like our government to try to address as we, as we talk about climate change in the coming uh, weeks and months. I'll just, I'll just jump over here first. Of course, yeah. One of my main concerns is misinformation or what I believe to be misinformation with regards to energy and climate change. Okay. Which is the reason why almost half the Canadians don't even believe in climate change. And that misinformation is being fostered by you know Peabody Coal yes. and Exxon and others. But the government is not giving us the straight scoop. And for example, we see our premier standing in front of a podium that says clean LNG on it. LNG is not cleaner than coal. And that's a complicated issue so but it's never been explained to us why it's not cleaner than coal. Particularly when that's converted to liquid and shipped to the Orient, it's much worse than coal. But we're not hearing that. Well, or, or if, if, if it is, or you know, like what, what are the, uh, the reasons that? Well, it, as I said, it's a little bit complicated, but natural gas is mostly methane. And methane has a global warming potential. It varies over time, but about 80 times worse than CO2. So the EPA has estimated that there's 3% loss of, of this natural gas while you're taking it underground and processing it delivering it, it becomes worse than coal. And they've also studied LNG, or L natural gas extraction in Colorado and find there's no wells that are less than 3%. And because this is invisible gas, and just escapes and nobody's keeping good tracks on it, it's not really counted as a global warming gas. And so LNG is not a step, in the, it's supposed to be a transitional fuel until we get more you know, renewables but it's actually worse. And the Site C dam is gonna be 10 billion by the time it's finished. Yeah. If that 10 billion was spent on subsidizing solar turbines, it's gonna be produce more energy than the Site C. The Site C is only gonna operate at less than 40% capacity most of the time. So there's all kinds of misinformation out there and I think it's up to the government to really, they know about all this stuff. There's all kinds of scientists in their, in their various departments that know the truth and they should be allowed to speak about it and so, politicians like yourself can get the word of it. So, fair point, it's, uh, you know, having the, uh, the science information uh, and, and government decisions available to the public to understand what decisions are being made. Yeah. We have to base everything on the best science available. Okay. I just want to admit, the new Langley event, sorry, with the new Langley event center, if there's going to be anything uh, on there where you could have, um, like, the home show and things like that, have a, 
a show regarding um, all the latest technologies, you know, the solar, the wind, the ocean, okay. the geothermal. And, and, that, and that make it really fun, you know, for people and, to and go and bring to this, up old um, these are the things different that booths, done. you know, and where people are expert on these things, explaining them to the population and that this is the wave of the future, this will save you money in the long term. Uh, this is healthier for your children, etc. You know, it'd be it'd be really nice to have that at the Langley Event Centre. Yeah, great suggestion. Yeah. Anybody else who hasn't spoken yet? Uh, ladies in the back, I want to put you on the spot. Is there anything you'd like to? Um, I'd like to know what the mandatory recycling programs are for businesses in the local area. Do you know? <coughs> Do you happen to know what they are? No. Okay. I, uh, <laughs> but, uh, no, we can. Uh, is that something that, that falls more under the the metro umbrella? Um, but if it's uh, something that's of interest, um, yeah. if you leave your contact ways. information, we can yeah. uh, find out tomorrow what, uh, what's being done for, um, are you interested primarily in businesses and industry? Businesses and industry, yeah, also okay. them personal, because I think as far as the homes go, um, there's, there is recycling programs within the homes and apartment buildings and all that, but I think it's the businesses that kind of lack. Yeah, well, I, I'll get your information <coughs> before you go. Well, no, and, and this is again the, the type of thing that we're looking for. What yeah. uh, you know, what concerns you would like to see us addressing? I think that ultimately we'd like to address climate change so that that doesn't happen. Yeah, we don't get exactly. to that point, yeah. and uh, you know that's why uh, in the uh, opening comments about you know, how do we bend that curve down from the amount of uh, emissions that we're um, pumping into the atmosphere that leads to climate change. Um, so how how do we do that so we can uh, meet the targets we agreed to um, in in Paris? And uh, you know to try and, and prevent some of the, uh, the things happening that um, that could happen if we don't get on top of it. So, how do you have, what pressure has been put on the other countries, in particular the U.S., India, and China, who produce ninety percent of the greenhouse gases? Canada is less than half a percent. Even if we do all these things and make all the changes we talk about, it's a drop in the bucket. If those three big economies don't change. It's irrelevant because that's ninety percent. Uh, they're not. I, I they're think not. That China's getting worse. India's getting worse. India's talking about they're going to do something in twenty thirty and maybe flatten out. China's twenty thirty five. But it's China irrelevant. Has increased the whale population like nobody's. I think that yeah, yeah, well, yeah, but but unless we push the big economies, we can do what we push. can within the international yeah. community, and, and then that's where. You know, diplomacy and you know, particularly environmental diplomacy comes in where we can deal with other countries to say, here's what we're doing. We can lead through innovation. We can encourage others to adapt and adopt things that uh, that we're developing. Uh, I had a, a meeting yesterday in Surrey, and people were saying, "Wow!" And, and I would apply it to Langley as well. You know, wouldn't it be great if we were uh, innovators on on this front, and we could actually export you know technologies to other countries to help deal with some of these issues. And uh, you know, then you have some of that economic uh, growth, and you're you're helping other countries meet. Um, you know, so again, we've heard the uh, investments in innovation and research. I think there's some really exciting opportunities but there. The two areas of innovation that are not being even tackled to any great extent is air transportation and sea transportation. Sea transportation, those those containers, ship, well, the, the ships out there, um, use dirty fuel. Um, one of them running, what was it, 
but, but something like a city of, about Vancouver, it puts out on one trip across the wave, it puts out something close to all the cars in Vancouver for six months. And how many ships are out there? You know, unless we're starting to tackle that, and that's dirty fuel they're using. Not even Thank clean you. fuel. The yeah. airlines are using cleaner fuel. It's less in, in that respect. But the amount they're putting out there, it, it's, it's great. And, and they're not being counted against any country in large part. Okay. So there's a whole other like thing. There's a whole other gray area, area research and which is huge. Basically, with our transportation. First yeah. More support than uh, you could imagine. Yeah. Right. Can I yeah. just say yeah. something about sure, trade? Yeah. What I always don't no, understand about these free trade agreements is we we have all these um, rules and policies in place, but no. the other countries, like he's mentioning, they don't, and we're yeah. trading with third countries all the time, and and they just get away with it. We're buying their product. We never have like say no. We're going to boycott you until you get your act together. We're getting our act together. It costs us a lot of money to make clean products and you know do it the clean but right. China, well, it's almost hypocritical to blame China for pollution when when we sit here in traffic and wait for yeah. those trains that go by for seven kilometers that are full of coal that are all being shipped directly to China so they can burn it. So yeah, we, we're just as responsible we be, for. We all should be working with them. And everybody. <coughs> They, they want to be clean too. They want to of course, they're just a hundred yeah. years behind us. London was exactly yeah. the same a hundred years ago. Yeah. Okay. Um, I was going to say, do you have anything you'd like to? Uh, no. No. Okay, so this is, okay. okay, perfect. I agree. Educate. Yeah. Just about China, they are installing more solar and more wind than any other country in the world. They just passed Germany as the world's largest oh. solar producer. Okay. So I don't think it's going to take them a hundred years, and I sure as hell don't think they're a hundred years behind us. I was in China about six months ago, and I saw all kinds of things we don't have, like 300 kilometer hour some trains. Of, some of China's 100 years behind us. I've been, I just got back from Shanghai. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's very eclectic in that respect. So I think we're all starting to think that. We've also committed to not build any more power. Coal but India's is going to want to take China on, on production of greenhouse gases in a couple of years if they haven't already done it. Yeah. Are, are, and they're not going to back down on it for about. Any of these areas that um, you know, we haven't touched on this today, anyone has any thoughts? Uh, I'm just wondering if we can get uh, uh, somewhere in here. I know uh, earlier you, you mentioned, uh, 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 well, my main point is this, the, that for heavy industry, or like uh, mining and whatnot, um, is it possible to uh, Question of the industry, or uh, as to how they can uh, reduce, reuse, or recycle the waste products that come from not only mining industry or oil sands or other heavy industries that do contribute to the pollution of uh, water or air or land. And uh, I think there's a, there's a, yeah, as a nature show showed that there's like 500 mining sites in BC that are just polluted to no end that uh, that the, the federal government doesn't want to remediate or can remediate. So that somewhere should be in there. Yes, I know the uh, every federal federal government wants to focus on uh, jobs, 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 but uh, if uh, a industry or uh, uh, like mining produces waste that's absolutely toxic, why can't we, we come up with innovations or technology or whatnot, uh, purposes, native or whatever, if they have a solution for that, to clean the waste left? Because uh, uh, after the, the, the mines leave or the gold mines leave, they don't remediate the sites. They, they leave it to the, the taxpayers in, 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 in uh, dependent communities to take care of it, and they don't have the money to remediate what what damage was done, be it to roads or or the the water, uh, the the fresh water or not, that's an area that should should be explored. Yes, you're going to give your the right to do this, but you should do it from beginning to end. Yeah. So sunset, uh, sunrise to sunset. Yeah. Uh, you're going to make a product great. 
but what are you gonna do with the waste that, that's generated from it? And that itself is an industry that is green and that can grow, right? And then when it comes to this mix with the sustainable norms, we don't want the norms. That's where you're gonna start catching. My understanding, is, I, know, I know in BC, it's meant to be mining operations, once the mines have finished their useful life, they're meant to be cleaned up. And I thought that was fair, but maybe it's not, but I'm, I'm pretty sure it's in BC. They're meant to, I, know, yeah, I, mean, I know most mining companies don't, they walk away at the end and they say they're bankrupt. But, but theoretically, they're meant to be putting aside money. Um, there was a fund set up at some point. If they go bankrupt, point. though, they can't. I understand that, but they were meant to be putting money into a, a fund managed by the government. Um, and all governments are to blame on that one. And it was meant to be then be used to clean up the, mine, the sites. And it was never, it. it's never been followed through, it's never been done. And it's only one company that got followed through. It's 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 a couple have done, but very few. One of the points that I've heard here, what I would take from what you said, is that you'd like to see um, industry continuing to innovate yeah. so that, uh, you know, that the, the impacts are lessened. And that um, at, at end, that we are taking that whole crane. Well, ideally, not, right not less, but net zero. Right. So, yeah. uh, yes, find a way to a get what you'd, you'd like cleanly and process it efficiently using renewable stuff like the solar power or the wind power or whatever. So that's the beginning of it, right? But also make sure that if there is a super fund or whatnot that someone is auditing it and making sure that yeah. uh, the money is actually spent to reclaim this land that's, uh, that's uh, uh, in some cases decimated, yeah. mm. especially up north uh, uh, where, where this stuff is just left, right? So beginning to end, be it uh, universities or colleges or, or whatnot that help, it, it has to be a, a, a all sides doing what they can to minimize the impact on uh, on on, uh, on the planet while still getting 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 what, what they need. A question that I have, I'll throw out to the group but um, a lot of things we're talking about you know there's there's jurisdiction issues within the the system that we have in Canada so some items fall under provincial jurisdiction and some fall under federal. What role would you like to see the federal government play in, in dealing with climate change? Or, or you know, like, is there a leadership role? Is there a support role? How would you like to see us engaging, say, with the provinces, which in, in many ways have a, a very strong um, role to play um, related to things like um, uh, climate change? Uh, you know, what, 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 um, what do you think the, the federal government should be doing? Yeah, I think, sorry, I, I just read we'll jump over here first. Sorry, really quickly, yeah. I just read something that the Union of BC Municipalities set forth. They all got together and sent a letter to the federal government to stop sites and dam and have a BC Utilities Commission. Look at this dam, they were against it. And that is what something the federal government should be really looking at and listening to the municipalities more. Yes. I, you know, without getting into all the detail, I'll tell you that the, the, the feedback we've been given on Site C is simply that under the previous government, all the permits were signed. It was, but it not was, with the First Nations. Right, but, but it was, it, it, it was approved big. under the, the reviews that big. were in place. No, I'm just saying no. that, that we were told as a government that we, there were no re further reviews or approvals uh, or that we couldn't revoke yeah. that decision. And so it, it, but it north, is But the Northern Gateway Pipeline was also approved by him and just turned down in the court of law. So we, now that, to me, is using Stephen Harbour as a scapegoat and easy way of saying, we wash our hands of it, of a bad deal. I don't agree with that. I think the federal government right now could go after the loophole of the First Nations was not consulted by Stephen Harper at all. And they are supposed to be, they were not. And that should start the ball rolling with Site C all over again to have a BC Utilities Commission look at it. The Joint Review Panel said no. So why are we spending hard-earned taxpayer dollars on something that is going to be a white elephant and we could be spending that money on cleaner energy, cleaner, much cleaner. Yeah, and you mentioned the investments. So I'm going to say, yeah, let's, yeah. if you've got somebody, you, know, you did you have your? Um, well, you know, I agree with, you know, I think in this room everybody wants the cleaner energy. So, right. you know, these dams. And, and yeah, the, the hydro is actually. These dams weren't energy. maybe under Bennett, no. you know, they weren't under Bennett. But, you know, you keep hearing, let's conserve energy. Well, in this building, there's so many lights on in these buildings. You don't need spotlights, strip lights. 
you know, if we all just cut back, we don't need a sightseeing dam. We can all have beautiful wind power, solar panels, you know, invest in those. We can all do that. We're not a massive population like China. And by the way, China has a three gorgeous dam and I believe it's hydroelectric. So they don't need as much coal in China now. But that's just one area of China, you know, three I gorgeous dam. But it is hydro mm -hmm. there they've got with this dam. But I'm just saying I agree with most of the people in this room that are saying we need the clean energies and maybe you could push for each province to be made more aware of the cleaner energies if they don't all are aware of what they can have because it's comfortable to stay in the status quo. But we have to reach forward to the clean stuff. Otherwise, we're going to destroy ourselves even more. Okay, so um, just a, a bit of a leadership role for our government to let them know the innovation mm -hmm. under uh, yes. yeah. Just kind of positive note, the ozone, the whole in the ozone layer has got smaller, but it's minus something or other, some kind of carbon or something like that. But uh, it has gotten smaller. I'm not going to put this on. Randy, did you have anything that you would like to well, add? Well, local communities a little bit better with the environment. So some of their local issues, some of the issues that the communities might have environmentally that they can't really afford to address on their own without other supports. Mm -hmm. It'd be nice for the federal government to support us more locally. And would that be through you know, funding? funding initiatives, uh, innovations, technologies, right? Like I know I just built a house in Langley City um, and during the construction, we noted that you, to get a permit in the city of Langley, you have to use uh, engineered truss systems on your home to allow for solar panels. It has to be, you have to do it as part of the build. So the house that I built is suitable to support solar paneling on the roof, as every new home construction, I'm assuming, in the Langley City. Um, but if you look on the roofs, you don't see any solar panels. And the main reason for that is there's no real initiatives or funding, it's too expensive. So we can't put them up. So, I mean, there is the great idea of making us support our homes so they can support solar panels. But where's the solar panels? Right? I can't afford to put them on my home. And I look around the neighborhoods and I look at all the brand new homes in Langley City and I don't see a single home with solar panels on it. So there's a disconnect there and I think that federally the government could come in and support us locally a little bit with initiatives like solar panels and things like that for yeah. new homes going into the area that could be more environmentally sustainable. Great feedback. Yeah. This is probably another question for BC, but in other provinces, uh, they consider ultimate, ultimate, ultimate energy as nuclear power, and I see, seriously disagree with that as well. That nuclear power is really not an alternative, alternative energy. Because uh, again, going back to my other example, there's no way to get rid of the byproduct of nuclear power, which is nuclear waste. There's a, I'll tell you, a very interesting, uh, in the Ottawa airport, uh, the nuclear uh, power producers have a great campaign going on right now. Um, so uh, if, if you fly through Ottawa, you'll see their, uh, their pitch happening. <laughs> no. I'd like to see the government pay for uh, quality scientific information so that you're not getting <coughs> kind of a hodgepodge of, uh, you know, So the National Research Council have a higher standing or have a, a seat in, in, in the stuff that you're doing because that's all science-based and also uh, take away uh, the muscle that the previous government put on yeah. scientists that uh, to, to disseminate and share their research or do research. So just uh, yeah, take the muscle off of those scientists and uh, expand the role of the National Research Council to do just that, uh, debunk the myths that are out there. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just on muscle the scientists. We have to give the liberal government that they get on muscle the scientists. Yeah, there, there was a, um, that was one of the first things last December, um, the scientists were given free reign to once again publish and uh, attend conferences and, and talk about the, the fantastic research that's being done at the, the federal level. 
Um, we're, we're just coming up on 8 o'clock, so I'd like to just invite if there are any closing comments and anybody has things that, um, you know, either that's come to mind or that you came and really wanted to say or share that you have, didn't have a chance, or uh, if you, um, you know, have other, you know, questions, and, and I can stay around after, but uh, we committed to spending about an hour talking about this, and you've given some great thoughts, so I, I appreciate that. Um, so, yeah, I'll just take a last couple of uh, closing thoughts from people, and then we'll um, be available to mingle. Uh, yeah, Rudy. Thank you very much, John. Thank, thank you for hosting this event. In, in a lovely community. energy in our lovely facility. Energy yeah. intense community center. <laughs> uh, obviously, this is a topic that is near and dear to the hearts of everybody in this room, and the community at large. This is something that is um, scary and big. Uh, it's something that simply throw ideas at the federal government and, and it's it's like throwing hatchets at the moon. You never know where those things are going to land. But if we take it to heart and we encourage our friends and neighbors, then we're actually making a difference. And maybe Canada's a relatively small player as far as the, the total problem. But we have relational um, relations with uh, other countries. So as we affect the individuals in our neighborhood and community, so Canada can affect the relationships that we have with other countries too. So I think it was brought up here, the idea is to increase personal awareness and, and then share that and bring it with you where you go. If you're at the job and you see something that's inappropriate, then there's an opportunity to do something good for yourself, for the planet, and spread the message. And that's it. Thank you. Great time. Comments. Um, go here. Okay. Um, you know, there must be some, there must be some hidden, you know, under the radar small companies in the Lower Mainland. There's, there's lots, I'm sure, I bet you, that could just give like seminars on the latest technologies in an evening like this. It doesn't cost really any money. Right. You know, if they're willing to do it, or if not, you could pay as a fee to come and, you know, listen to what they have to say. But, you know, other than that, you know, but also have big events like a different, like Langley Event Centre in Vancouver throughout the Lower Mainland where we've got their big buildings like this to give informational sessions on a regular basis throughout the year so that everybody is aware of all these latest technologies and where they can find out more if they can look online. But these people are, who are experts who have businesses in these areas currently and are experts, you know, like you have the experts with the technology and computers, but with these new innovations with the solar, the wind, etc. Uh, and where you can learn more, where you can buy them, where you can have access to them, if you'd like them in the future for yourself or your business, and where they can really zoom people up and get them excited about it. You know, I think it would be, I, I'd go to that. Yeah, thank you. Um, Mary, do you want to make any comments as well? I, I have to say that um, we're really lucky to have um, Mary Pollock here tonight, the Minister of the Environment, and uh, Mary's being you know, involved, really uh, immersed in this. Uh, um, are, are there any thoughts that you'd like to share? I don't want to put you on the spot, but um, <laughs> yes, <I'm laughs> you know, the honor is here. You want to raise your hand? Well, then, you know, she can say no. <laughs>
much that we're, although we've heard you know, maybe some, uh, some uh, statements today hoping or wishing that the BC government could go further, you know, but I, I think that um, you know, we need to acknowledge that BC really has led in many ways uh, nationally over a lot of years. And uh, I think set the standards uh, very high for the country on a lot of environmental fronts, including climate change. So uh, I think we have a great, uh, very great partnership, a great relationship, and um, you know I, I actually have hope that um, by working together with the provinces, uh, with the, the uh, various environment ministers, and and, um, and and the leadership that we have across the country, that we're we're positioning ourselves to meet that very large task of of stopping uh, you know, or meeting the, the two percent warming and, and possibly aiming even for that one and a half degree um, target. And uh, it's through, I think, these kind of conversations, more importantly, taking these conversations, moving, converting them into action, and, um, and not just you know, putting on the shelf. If we actually do something about it, that's how we're going to rise to this very large challenge that's ahead of us. So thank you so much, everybody, for coming out this evening. I hope you uh, <laughs> picked up some li either ideas or felt you being able to contribute and again Raj's uh, thumbs have been going throughout so uh, I've been capturing um, the feedback we'll make sure that this does get submitted to our minister um, so that um, you can say here are some of the thoughts from our community in Langley City uh, and so I really appreciate you making the time to us this evening. And, yeah, my, I have some brochures here and uh, my contact information's there. Um, somebody mentioned as well, you don't know where my office is, so Fraser Highway and 64, uh, we're in the, uh, the new development there, so you know, stop by if you have other thoughts, um, email us, phone us, and I uh, hope to see you out at some other of uh, these uh, town halls that we're having. So, yeah, thank you. Sorry about the bad thing.